Across America, live, this is Point of View with Marlon Maddox. And now, here's Marlon. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. It is a delight to have you in the audience. Our guest today, Mr. Patrick Buchanan. We're going to be talking about his new book that's been on the New York Times bestseller for weeks and weeks. The title of the book is The Death of the West. You prime ready to go, uh, Penna? I'm ready. I've been actually waiting for this for a long time because uh, this book has been out just a few weeks, and of course it's already way up there on the New York Times bestseller list and has been for a while. But this book explains some things, and I think mm -hmm. our listeners are going to mm -hmm. get quite an education today. John, I see you've made some notes there. You know pretty good and well that I have been looking forward to this one for a while. This book is something else, and today we're going to find out what evidence lies behind the title, The Death of the West, mm -hmm. from Pat Buchanan. Mm -hmm. And again, it's always a, a thrill to talk to the man you voted for for president, too. All so right. it's good to have Pat Buchanan here today. Patrick, good to have you, sir. Well, thanks very much, Marlon. Appreciate it. Good to be back here. Good to be with you. Good to have you. Uh, Pat, did you read uh, in the paper where Gorbachev uh, has said uh, that uh, communism actually was pure propaganda and they were lying all the time? <laughs> <laughs> I certainly did. You know, it looks like maybe old Ronald Reagan was right there after all, huh? Well, you know, uh, it, it, it's, it's amazing. I've been lying to you all this time, but believe me now, right? Yeah, believe me now. We're for a new world order now. It's different, but uh, we were lying to you before when we told you communism was a was a real paradise in the Soviet Union. But it is a remarkable statement. Uh, it is. For the last leader of the Soviet Empire yep. uh, to admit it's been a pack of lies agreed upon all along. And it certainly exposes the folly of a lot of Americans from Lincoln Steffens on, who said, I've been over into the future. Yeah. And it works uh, all the way through the fellow travelers and those who told us in the 1960s that, uh, you know, the communists were catching up to us and the people behind the Iron Curtain were happy and... Uh, and it was just propaganda to say they weren't. You know, I, I would say that it uh, would shame uh, the professors on the college campuses, but they don't have shame. But how are they going to explain this? It's going to be a little difficult. That's, you know, I remember saying that to a friend of mine, Alan Riskin, in 1989, you know, that communism has collapsed in Eastern Europe. And now it's collapsing in the Soviet Union, and pretty soon it's going to collapse in China and Vietnam and Cuba. Mm-hmm. And then we're going to be able to get all our forces together and move on the last redoubts at Berkeley and Harvard. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be a bloody, bloody battle, Pat. I got to admit, <laughs> these these fellows will fight to the end for absolutely. <laughs> 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 kind of like flushing out the last of the Al Qaeda, yeah. you know. <laughs> Pat, I want to. We're going to talk about uh, immigration. We're going to talk about a lot of things, but uh, Chapter Four intrigues me, and. Uh, in it, you talk about the death of the West. You talk about certain men that are involved in that, in that long march through the institutions and so on. Uh, there's, there's such names as Gramsci. There's uh, names, the Frankfurt School uh, comes to America and so on. Uh, if That could have been a separate book. Just what you said there uh, is something that America needs to hear. Tell us about that. That's, <clears throat> I put that chapter in there because this really is one of the hidden tributaries of the, of the social revolution that has captured America and tens of millions of American young. And what it is is a group of cultural Marxists who in World War I finally came to the conclusion that, that Karl Marx was wrong, that the working class, the proletariat, was not going to rise up and overthrow Western governments. And the reason they weren't was the working people of the West been marinated in 2,000 years of Christianity, and that's why they rejected the revolution in Hungary and in, and in Munich and in Berlin uh, back after World War I. And so these cultural Marxists formed a, a Marxist school in, in Frankfurt modeled on a school in the Soviet Union, and the school was designed basically to create a new weapon to undermine the West, and it was cultural Marxism. Mm -hmm. And by that, I mean that they decided that the way we're going to capture the West is peacefully, not by violent revolution, but by de-Christianizing the West and proceeding on a long march through the institutions, as they call it, capturing the seminaries, the media, the entertainment media, radio, magazines, art, architecture, literature, everything, to move into all of these cultural institutions 
de-Christianize them, and through these institutions that form the values and beliefs and opinions of the young, to de-Christianize the West. And once the West was completely de-Christianized, uh, it would have lost its immune system to revolutionary values, and then the revolutionary values could take root in the soul of the West. And it culminated around the 1960s on the campuses of America. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what happened then was the sexual revolution, which these cultural Marxists preached, frankly, uh, took hold. And you had not only had a sexual revolution, you had the anti-American, anti-war revolution. Mm-hmm. You had feminism and all these forms of radicalism, rejection of Western values. And they were a minority culture back in the 60s. They were defeated by Ronald Reagan, of course, in 49 states. But now that's become the dominant culture in America. And that's the reason the West is dying. It has embraced this carcinogenic, this, this cultural Marxism, uh, feminism, uh, radicalism, consumerism, hedonism, la dolce vita. And to the degree that Western young uh, imbibe in this uh, cultural revolution, they're dying. Pat, uh, you, you know, as you write in your book, and it, it un- unfolds it uh, so clearly that uh, the the Marxists figured that when war came that they were going to rise up the workers were and throw off their chains and so on. But uh, as they said, Christianity was so embedded in their thought processes, nothing, uh, you know, really happened. And, exactly. and even in the Soviet Union, the people never, other than uh, the ruling part of the Soviet Union, they never really bought into the whole Marxist idea, did they? Yeah, you know, this is what, what Solzhenitsyn told us when he was here. Yeah. He said, Russia is the first captive nation, and he was right. And this is what this brilliant communist, Gramsci, recognized when he went to the Soviet Union in the 1920s. Uh, and he was a hardcore communist, the head of the Communist Party later on. But he looked out at the Soviet Union and said, this is not a success, it's a failure. Mm -hmm. The people don't love the Communist Party, they despise it. They love their lion, they love their icons, they love Mother Russia, they love their families, they love their faith, and they're simply following orders because the the alternative will be to shot a shot in the back of the head in the Lubyanka prison. And he said, this communism, even though Lenin and Stalin claim it succeeded, has failed in taking root in the hearts of the men and women of Russia. We want a communism that will succeed in that. And he went back to Italy, where he was locked up in prison, and he wrote the famous prison notebooks about the long march through the institutions. And it was Gramsci's uh, blueprint for a communist revolution that was peaceful, that has prevailed when the Soviet Union has expired. And it is this revolution that continues to gain converts even in the United States of America today. Let me take a break. I want to come back, Pat. I want you to pick that up just a little bit and paint the picture of just how uh, this plan has been carried out, particularly on the campuses and throughout society, because so many of them think that they have thought of it themselves, but they are the product of a well-laid plan. Pat Buchanan with us. Don't go away. We'll be right back. Every day, 3,805 children die because of choice. It is our responsibility to speak on behalf of those that cannot speak for themselves. Join the fight to save the lives of unborn children. Pray every day for the pro-life movement. Educate yourself. Communicate with friends and family your pro-life philosophy. Volunteer at GRTL or another pro-life organization. Together, we can save lives. This has been a perspective on life from Georgia Right to Life. For more information, visit our website, www.grtl.org. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Pat Buchanan with us today. Page 77 of his book, The Death of the West, Pat says this, Rather than seize power first and impose a cultural revolution from above, Gramsci argued, Marxists in the West must first change the culture. Then power would fall into their laps like ripened fruit. But to change the culture would require a long march through the institutions, the arts, cinema, theater, schools, colleges, seminaries, and so on. And said one by one, each had to be captured and converted and politicized into an agency of revolution. Then the people could be slowly educated to understand 
and even welcomed the revolution. Gramsci urged his fellow Marxists to form popular fronts with Western intellectuals who shared their contempt for Christianity and bourgeois culture and who shaped the minds of the young. Uh, Pat Buchanan, uh, John Dewey, a great influence in uh, education here in America, as well as others, uh, they have been successful in marching through the institutions, the arts, uh, the theater, the schools, the colleges. Uh, I think Gramsci would be proud of his uh, acolytes, don't you? I think Gramsci would say, uh, I was the father, even though I died uh, basically in an Italian fascist prison uh, in the 1930s, uh, I am the father of the revolution which has captured the Western world and will bring the West down and bring it to an end just as we had hoped and we had worked for all of our lives. Uh, it is unquestionable. Uh, Marlon, you know, I was in college in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. And in college we studied, uh, when we studied English, we studied English and theology and physics and, and history and all of these subjects. You know, I can't recall being required to go through any kind of political orientation or even discussion in class go right. being in college was about learning all of these this the the, the traditions and, and learning the knowledge that the west had produced up to that time and up to where we were and now our campuses have been thoroughly politicized the professors use them as as forums to indoctrinate students in in correct thinking you hear about these sex classes at berkeley where they're going down and uh, uh, they're going down to sex clubs and watching the professor perform. Yeah. Uh, the change is so tremendous, and yet we now have become sort of almost acclimated to reading these stories that would have stunned people in the 1950s. You, and it shows how far the pendulum has gone. You, you know, when, uh, when Jesse Jackson, uh, I, I guess 60s, 70s, or whenever it was, leading the rallies, chanting, Western culture must go. Right. Did he have any clue that he was just falling into the guidelines that were set by Gramsci and these other guys? You know, when he was, went through Stanford yelling, hey, hey, ho, ho, Western Civ, for the course in Western civilization, yep. has got to go, I don't think Jesse Jackson is a deep person, candidly. I know Jesse, and, and I think it is uh, basically he is, if you will, acting out his role in a play that was written a long time ago, and he has imbibed all these ideas that are put forward, and he's just acting it out. He no more knows that than, uh, than some 10-year-old in, in a play in school uh, knows uh, the source of the lines he is reading. Wow. I think uh, about that, that may underestimate Jesse somewhat, but clearly he is not a man of the depth of these people who knew exactly what they're doing as they... You know what I look, I look at? I look at the Christianity as, the, as really the immune system of the West. Right, and I what agree. the communists and Marxists want to do, if you break down and destroy the immune system, That's right. then all these opportunistic infections can invade, and they won't be resisted. They will be embraced. And that will bring about the death of the patient, the death of the West. It really is, AIDS is a perfect metaphor mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, for what this uh, cultural revolution uh, in America has has accomplished. And by now, there are countless institutions. I mean, you see judges reflecting its values. Certainly compare the films we see in the 1950s with their celebration of heroism and family uh, and, and, and America with the values that are uh, celebrated in so many films today. Not all of them, but so many of them. Pat, uh, you can see, of course, now in America that uh, the goals of these four revolutionaries that you mentioned in Chapter 4 have been accomplished, and they've really de-Christianized America. But I guess the question I have is that in Russia, of course, you had the barrel of a gun stopping people from putting up a fight against this type of thing. But here in America, you didn't have that. So where was the church in standing up against this? Well, some there's, there's no doubt that there are the, the Cultural Revolution and its agency, frankly, the Supreme Court was captured and set about de-Christianizing America. As I mentioned, I believe it's chapter 8 or 9, or I'm sorry, 7 or 8. And as that happened, there was a, a healthy reaction on the part of a healthy society. Uh, this is why you've had the rise of all these of Christian radio and bookstores and, uh, 
and, and, and schools. What these are is, is a rise, a reaction to the capture of the institutions by these cultural Marxists and the imposition of alien values on children. Uh, but unfortunately, that's only part of the country has reacted healthily. There's an enormous part of it, if you will, that embrace Woodstock values of, of the 1960s, MTV values, and the sexual revolution uh, that has been very much lost uh, to the traditional culture to the point where it is fair to say that the traditional culture in America, which was uh, Christian-based, has become the minority culture, and this, uh, and this new culture, this hedonism, this consumerism, this materialism, uh, this MTV culture, this, you know, the idea of just, you know, eat, uh, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, uh, this culture has captured a majority of Americans. Some churches have resisted heroically, but there's no question some churches themselves have gone over to the revolution. It's not unusual. In the French Revolution, some of the, you found some of the Catholic cardinals were turning up in the diplomatic corps of the French Revolution, which was determinedly anti-Christian. Mm -hmm. Pat, as you said, there are many institutions that are heroically fighting. Is it possible for the Christian culture to ever return in this country? Do you see that uh, as even a possibility? Well, it is hard to say that we are winning. Uh, we are, I mean, all clearly all is not lost. We have a great country, and it's an enormous country. And a tremendous number of people are, are resisting this in various ways. Homeschooling is a manifestation. Uh, what is happening, Penna, is good people are seceding from mm -hmm. this culture, which is toxic. Mm -hmm. They sense it. They know it. It's just as though we hear that, look, the, uh, the central water supply, someone has put anthrax and poisons into it, and so we've got to go out and get bottled water because we want to survive. We're not going to imbibe it anymore. It'll sicken us, and it'll kill us. And so I think clearly there is what you would call a remnant of good people out there. Now, the question is, does the future belong to them? Uh, I think there is clearly a fighting chance, because this culture is a carcinogenic. And the title of my book, Death of the West, points out that every single Western nation is dying. Not one has a birth rate that will enable it to stay alive. In 1960, we were 25 percent of the world's population in a tremendously healthy baby boom. In the year 2000, we were down to 16 percent, and every nation was dying. If it continues, we'll go to 10 percent at mid-century and about 2 percent of the world's population uh, at the end of the century, which means we will be irrelevant. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, can you turn it around? Uh, obviously, the answer to that has got to be yes. But I'll be honest, when you take a look at... Uh, what is happening in America, just in population, you know, 42 million abortions since 1973, mm -hmm. and something like 35 to 40 million folks have come from foreign countries to take the places of the Americans never born. And many of these folks, these folks are falling in with the dominant culture in America, which is not our culture. So, uh, you know, it's, 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 you know, we are in retreat. We are not defeated, but we are not advancing and taking back lost ground either. Patrick Buchanan with us uh, today. There's so much, uh, Pat, to talk with you about. I've got a break coming up here in about a minute. But uh, we want to talk to you uh, about the fact that uh, we're killing our future generations, uh, which, which is a horrible, horrible thing. But also, it used to be that America was a place where people migrated to. They were assimilated by the culture. But we're having many cultures coming into this country and seem to be influencing the culture of America rather than America influencing them. So I want to ask you what kind of an effect uh, uh, that uh, is, is going to have on us. Pat Buchanan is with us, ladies and gentlemen. His book is entitled The Death of the West. It's been on the New York Times bestseller list uh, for a long time. And I would uh, encourage you to get a copy of it and read it. I found it absolutely fascinating. I've got yellow highlighter all over it. And uh, it's just available almost uh, anywhere you, uh, you want to go. Pat also writes for worldnetdaily.com. And you might want to pick up some of his uh, columns there. You'll find those to be very, very interesting. worldnetdaily.com. Let me take a quick break here. We'll come back and continue with our guest today, Mr. Patrick Buchanan. Stay with us. You are listening to Point of View with Marlon Maddox. 
For materials offered during the program, please write to Point of View, Post Office Box 30. That's Box 30, Dallas, Texas 75221, zip 75221. Or call our toll-free number, 1-800-347-5151. That's 1-800-347-5151. The opinions expressed on Point of View do not necessarily reflect the views of the management or staff of this station. Point of View will continue after this. Abortion activists accuse pro-life advocates of lacking compassion and of being intolerant. But how does the dictionary define compassion and tolerance? It says tolerance is the willingness to recognize and respect the beliefs and practices of others, and compassion as a deep awareness of the suffering of another, coupled with the strong desire to relieve it. Abortion kills children and hurts women. Now I ask you, how can a truly compassionate person tolerate that? This has been a Perspective on Life from Georgia Right to Life. Visit us at grtl.org. You are listening to Point of View with Marlon Maddox. The opinions expressed on Point of View do not necessarily reflect the views of the management or staff of this station. And now, here again, is Marlon Maddox. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Good to have you with us. Ben Dexter, John Driggs in the studio with me. Our guest on the line, Patrick Buchanan. We're talking about his book, The Death of the West, How Dying Populations and Immigrant Invasions Imperil Our Country and Civilization. John Driggs, Dying Populations, Immigrant Invasions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there seems to be a, a connection in uh, the, the troubles this nation is seeing with the topics you're uh, mentioning clearly, Marlon. Uh, Pat, let me ask you to develop your, your uh, AIDS metaphor a little further. Uh, Americans today, are, are we simply HIV positive, or are we suffering from a full-blown AIDS? And I suppose when you consider the abortion problem in America today, you've got to say this cultural AIDS is pretty well developed. Well, I think it is. If, uh, if the uh, America's native-born population, homegrown Americans, are not even reproducing themselves, then the country is on its way to death unless something intervenes and turns it around. I think the dechristianization of America, which was... Uh, Again, I think clearly, well, clearly it's got roots not only in the, in the Frankfurt School, but way, all the way back to the Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. But it was really among a group of elites who were hostile to the idea of Christianity and of capitalism and of all that flourished as a consequence of Christianity and its culture. But now I think they've become the dominant culture. I think it, uh, I would put the 1960s as the point at which it became full-blown AIDS. Wow. This Marxism we talked about earlier, is abortion uh, part and parcel of that uh, mindset? Is that, uh, those two just go hand in hand? I think abortion is the quintessence of the uh, culture of death, uh, which is, uh, you know, this is, uh, we're here on Earth, it's a short period, who cares whether we stick around or anyone sticks around when we're gone. It is quite clear, I think, that abortion, which is, uh, which is killing out Western man, I think is a, is a clear manifestation. It's one of these... Uh, uh, it's one of these cancers that comes about as a consequence of having HIV and of having the immune system break down, that the people begin to die. And, you know, I could not find a single Western country where the birth rate is sufficient to keep it alive in its present form through mid-century. Wow. Every single country in Europe is dying or has begun to die or its birth rate is already stagnant, its birth rate is already below replacement level, except for one, Muslim Albania. And the interesting thing is that you find that the, the correlation to where faith dies and religion dies, a people begin to die, is almost absolute. Uh, for example, the evangelical and Christian folks and fundamentalist folks of Texas, for example, have a higher birth rate than the secular Americans of California. Uh, you know, the uh, La La Land and La Dolce Vita country. And it is, I found a Jewish community, for example, up in northern New York in Newmarket, where the average family has 10 children, but the secular Jewish population uh, is not even at replacement levels. Uh, Utah, where the Mormon faith is very strong, has a very healthy birth rate, one of the healthiest in the, quote, white world, where Russia, which is even poor, 
but where the old orthodox faith was rooted out by communism, and now even communism is gone, uh, they've begun to die as rapidly as any people on earth. Amazing. Talk about the uh, aging of the population and how this plays into it, because not only does that mean that, of course, that the composition is going to eventually change, but also these, the type of society is going to change as you have to take care of this population. Am I right? Right, exactly. Well, let's take Europe where the example is very, very clear. Europe has never had high immigration from anywhere, but the European nations will lose there are now 720 million Europeans in the world. I mean, in Europe, if you just take strictly Europeans from Russia to Iceland. Uh, they will lose 128 million people by mid-century will disappear. Mm. The equivalent of the entire population of Holland, Denmark, uh, Sweden, Norway, Belgium, and Germany wow. disappear. Wow. And the median age of all Europeans will be 50 years old, which is nine years older than the oldest nation on Earth today, Japan. But equally important... 10% of the population, 60 million Europeans, will be over 80. Now, with the working population falling dramatically and the elderly exploding in numbers, clearly Europe has got to do something. Either it's got to cut back dramatically on the benefits for the elderly, health and welfare and pensions, or it's got to bring in tens of millions of workers. And that's what's happening. They're coming in, only they're coming from a culture and civilization, Islam, which has never been friendly to the West, and it is indeed in many cases has been hostile to it. So now you've got 5 million Muslims, for example, in France. And two weeks ago you read that the, the Muslim population, because of this Middle East explosion, is engaged in all kinds of assaults and insults against the 600,000 Jewish population in France. Uh, and and the, the social tensions are rising. And so this has enormous strategic implications as well. I mean, it's why Europe is not going to be supporting any American assault on a Muslim or Islamic country, mm -hmm. because they've got these huge populations which exercise sort of a social veto by virtue of possible uh, disorders in the country. And you've also got Al-Qaeda cells all across Europe. But what is Europe going to do if it continues to die out and it ages? It's going to need more people, first, to take care of the elderly, and secondly to work and provide the taxes that take care of the pensions and the health care costs of the elderly. So I don't see how Europe escapes this trap. Pat Buchanan with us. If you have a question for Pat, let me open the phone lines for you and uh, come and join our discussion. Address uh, your question to Pat Buchanan when I put you on the air. And the phone number, 1-800-351-1212, one 800 Three five one one two one two. You know, Pat, if you just look at uh, the growth of population, you'd say that uh, the United States is is a healthy growth, but uh, our population is dying, and a lot of this is made up through immigration. Well, it's almost one hundred percent. I think two thirds wow. of all of our growth was through immigrants and their and their children coming in, and it's going to be even greater as the native-born American population uh, begins to stagnate and then begins to diminish. Uh, but, you know, what they call, you know, as I tell folks, I, I, my, 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 grand, my mom is German-American, and uh, they, their folks came over a good while ago, but she's German-American, and I'm Irish-American. And, of course, the Germans and Irish had one thing in common. Uh, they both fought the English, and they both lost. <laughs> But now in California, I'm known as an Anglo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but the truth is, the, the Anglos uh, are a minority in California now. They're a minority in New Mexico, and they will be a minority in Texas in, in mm -hmm. about three or four years. And as they be become a minority, people tend to move where they're comfortable. And 100,000 Anglos a year leave California net. Its Anglo population not only is not growing, it is actively diminishing because people are leaving California. And California, and you can project when it will become a dominant. In other words, when Hispanics are an actual majority in California. And most Ta of these folks are from Mexico. All right. Give us, give us a scenario of the increasing Islam uh, population here in the United States based on what happened September 11th and the uncovering of the fact that a lot of those people don't like us. And I, well, what, of course, what happened is that uh, we discovered suddenly after September 11th that interviews were done 
even out here in Potomac, Maryland, with school kids who said, you know, the Americans pretty much got what they deserved. Yeah. And, uh, and the Islamic, I mean, many, I know many Muslims, and we all know many Arab folks who are very uh, law-abiding and who love this country as much as any of the rest of us love it and are honored and delighted to mm-hmm, be here. Mm-hmm. But there's no doubt there's a, a tremendously a militant aspect to Islam now, which is on the rise, which is deeply anti-Western and deeply anti-American, and which sees uh, its time coming again. Uh, and many Western folks don't realize that for, for from, uh, you know, that, that Europe, uh, one of the great invasions of Europe uh, was the uh, Islamic invasion, which got all the way through, conquered France, I mean, excuse me, Spain for about 600 years, and got all the way up to central France before they were stopped at Poitiers in around 732 A.D., and driven back into Spain, where they stayed until 1492. Mm-hmm. And then they came up through the Balkans and occupied all the, excuse me, the, the Balkans and occupied Hungary and were only stopped at Vienna mm-hmm. by a Polish king. And that was about only uh, not much more than 300 years ago. This is rising again. Just as I could not find a single Western country where the population was not dying, there is not one Islamic country on earth where the population is not exploding. Let me take a break. Pat Buchanan with us, 1-800-351-1212. Come and join us. We're talking about his new book. The title of it is The Death of the West, and uh, it's a barn burner, folks, and it's got some facts that you need to face. It's, it's like a bucket of cold water right in the face, and you need to read it. It's called uh, Death of the West. Your phone call's next. The Bible says in Joshua 24, verse 15, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And join our conversation with Pat Buchanan, 1-800-351-1212. John is in the state of Arizona. John, thanks for calling. Good afternoon. Uh, I supported Pat in 96. In fact, down here in Yuma, he got a higher ratio of votes than anywhere else in the state, and I believe in him. And I want to ask a question. My question is, why cannot the American people get grand juries anymore? We've asked Senator, uh, we, excuse me, uh, Attorney General Ashcroft, uh, about a grand jury for Enron? Nothing. Uh, he didn't lay the, the current guidelines. It seems to be Janet Reno never did anything for the American people. And then when Mr. Condit was uh, being the people of the county where he's in wanted to indict him, the prosecutor said uh, they didn't have jurisdiction. I- insane things. What do you think, Pat? Well, I think that certainly uh, if, if, any, if any company in America has ever has ever called forth a grand jury to take in, take a look into its proceedings, it would be Enron. I agree. And uh, I don't know exactly why the Attorney General has or has not made such a decision. My guess would be it would probably be a, a decision of a U.S. attorney in a particular district to do that. And I don't know that any veto has been exercised at the level of the Attorney General, but I think they, uh, uh, I mean, the gentleman's indignation at, at Enron and what it did to its people is, uh, is sure justified. Pat, let's go back to the phones and talk to Marilyn calling from Kansas. Marilyn, your question, please, for Pat Buchanan. I heard last night about George Bush's, President Bush's new uh, proposal about USA Freedom Corps. Have you heard about it? Do you know what it is? And how does that compare with Hitler's Mein Kampf? Well, I mean, I don't think it's Hitler's youth, but I do think it probably bears a striking resemblance to Bill Clinton's America Corps. Uh, which I never thought was that good an idea, and I have not seen the details on the, on the, on the, on Mr. Bush's proposal. But I certainly would not compare up uh, the president, who I, I agree with on many things. I think he's done a good job out there in Afghanistan. I disagree on many. And uh, last night, I'll be honest, I was less focused on the, on the USA Corps, whatever it is, and I was on amnesty for the uh, one million illegal aliens, which I think was a dreadful, dreadful thing to do. Uh, Pat Buchanan with us today, and the phone number, 1-800-351-1212. Let's go to Florida and talk to Gary. Hi, Gary. Hello. Hey, go right ahead. Hi, Gary. How are you, sir? How are you? 
Great, great. I've been listening to your uh, show here, and I was very interested in it, um, uh, your book on the death of the West. I've not read it, but I had a question for you in reference to the Church kind of being like a remnant or an, an immune system, if you will, like you had put it. Uh, and that was that the Church is to be the salt and the light of the world, and in it there's, a, there's an effect that should the people of the world will know us by our love one for another. And my question really is, is the Church really encouraging experiential Christianity that can have this effect that we're talking about maybe being able to turn things around, or is its agenda more focused toward attendance or, or other elements? Good question, Pat. What well, do you that think? is an excellent question. And it is clear the, the Church is, is, is doing is, is both, in that sense that the, the Church is enormous, and parts of it are very healthy, and parts of it are really doing the Lord's work as the Lord prescribed, whereas other parts have, have become trendy and, and really have become se- deeply secularized and who look, at, look for their rewards right here in the, in the secular world and who do not want to be out of step. Uh, you know, Fulton Sheen, who was a great, uh, a great Catholic uh, preacher, said, you know, what we need is not a church that is right when the world is right, a church that is right when the world is wrong. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what we need in many cases today, and in some cases we get it. We all know priests and preachers and pastors who are standing up against the, uh, of the con- conventional w- wisdom, and we all know that uh, the trendy types of clerics who were running with the revolution in the 1960s in order to be immensely popular and were, and all the secular city types who were, who, to make themselves relevant to the 1960s are now completely irrelevant in the year 2000 when people are looking for truth, I think. So I don't think we can say the church is one or the church is the other. I do think this, there's no question about it, that Christianity, which took root in in the heart and souls of, of, of Western man, and indeed, even when some generations tend to lose it, much of it lingers on. I look upon it as sort of a bungee rope for many people who they will leave the church, but Something was put into them that, that when they fall, they don't quite hit the rocks. Uh, they're pulled back, and in middle age, they might be coming back. And you find that a lot, among a lot of these baby boomers who might have been, uh, who are sitting in the back pews now, who might have been up in the mud at Woodstock 25 years ago. You know, Pat, uh, I, I, I totally agree with you. I, I'm doing, uh, uh, writing a book on public education and do, doing some uh, study there. But uh, this long march through the institutions has been so very effective, little by little, all of the consciousness of God taken out of the minds of, of the young and their reasoning from a moral relativistic standpoint that, uh, you know, even with the 9-11 thing, you'd think that everybody would pray. But if you don't have that God consciousness, that, that bungee cord that you're talking about, uh, there was no inclination, even from uh, some of those, uh, to even think of God. He doesn't exist. As well, far exactly, as they've gone. They've been. They're a couple of generations removed now. Yeah. And uh, and, it, and you know, and this is what I find. You know, and of course, I've been getting a hard time or from some students ever since I used to defend uh, John F. Kennedy and, and Lyndon Johnson on the campuses and be yeah. called names. But nowadays, what is so tragic is at least many of those '60s kids who were they were against you were very intelligent and also knowledgeable, and they were aware of their traditions, and they had studied history. A lot of these kids you see on campuses are oblivious to anything. That's right. They don't know anything. It's, uh, you know, it's hard to get a reference point to even begin to argue with them. They know no history of the United States Zero at all. history. Yeah. Zero. I think that's by design. Now we continue to take your calls for Pat Buchanan. Let's go to Ronald up in Canada. Hi, Ronald. You're on the air. Yes, good afternoon. Uh, Pat, uh, up here in Canada, your book is selling very well indeed. Oh, good. And I bought it a month ago, as a matter of fact. Uh, the I agree entirely. Your logic is irrefutable. The only thing I wanted to ask you was why you confined your analysis primarily to Europe and North America and didn't take into account Australia and South America a little more. Uh, Australia and South America are two continents where the white Christian race is demographically fairly healthy in several of the uh, nations, and where I think the future of the West is somewhat brighter than in North America and Europe. 
All right, well, let me say, um, I did not, you're right, I did not break out Australia, and I only broke out about five European countries, yeah. and I took the whole of Europe. But Australia, I have not heard that, and I have not heard that about uh, South America. I do know that I get questioned all the time that South America, because so much of it is heavily Catholic, is that not Western? And it's, you know, a good argument can be made, although basically what I was using was those countries were considered, I guess, first world and Western countries, and, and Western in the sense of the East-West conflict against the Soviet Union, and then when the Soviet Union collapsed, I included all of those countries that had been captured by communism, which I consider, incidentally, a, a Christian heresy, and which was overthrown in its militant form, uh, but when it, in its cultural form, it is taking root. But I did not know, and I will take a look, certainly, to see if, uh, if it is true for Australia. And I don't know how the breakout is on the populations down in South America, and frankly, I just didn't have time. And I, I didn't know that what that would add to the argument, but you make some very good points. Pat Buchanan with us today. We're talking about his book uh, entitled The Death of the West. Uh, I would in strongly encourage ministers to read this book, and uh, those of you who are politically involved, uh, I think what I'm trying to say, those of you who really care for America, I would, I would advise you to get a copy of it and, and read it because he's making some points in here. You may agree or disagree with uh, some of them, but uh, his points are very well taken. And he talks about America being, uh, you know, right at a danger point right now. And I think America needs to hear these words. Pat Buchanan, the title of the book is uh, The Death of the West. I'm going to take a quick break. We'll come back, and Bob and Richard and Inga and Pamela and the rest of you hang on. We'll get to your calls right after this. Across the nation, this is Point of View with Marlon Maddox. For materials offered during the broadcast, please write to Point of View, Post Office Box 30. That's Box 30, Dallas, Texas, 75221. Zip 75221. Or call our toll-free number, 1-800-347-5151. Point of View will continue after this. Point of View is produced by International Christian Media and is supported by your tax-deductible contributions. Please turn the tape over at this point for the remainder of the program. Across America, live. This is Point of View with Marlon Maddox. And now, here's Marlon. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. John Driggs, Benedexter in the studio with men on the line with us, Patrick J. Buchanan. And we're talking about his book, uh, The Death of the West. If you'd like to talk to him, the phone number, 1-800-351-1212. Direct your question to Pat Buchanan. And let's go to Houston, Texas, and talk to Pamela. Hi, Pamela. Hi. Go right ahead. I want to say that I'm a big Pat Buchanan supporter, and I hope he will run again. And uh, my question is, it's mind-boggling that we could pass amnesty after six months after 9-11, but now that it has been done, what is that solution? What would be his next recommendation for uh, what we should do under those circumstances? Well, okay, uh, Pamela, thanks very much for the kind comments. Uh, in my view, it was a terrible, terrible mistake. Uh, amnesty is going to demoralize our Border Patrol, who have been <clears throat> really fighting to enforce America's laws. It's going to, and uh, what's being said to those Border Patrol fellows is, uh, you were fools to stop these folks from coming in, because now we're going to put them first in line on the road to citizenship by giving them an amnesty. It's made fools out of all those good folks who waited for years back in their home countries and filled out the forms and obeyed our laws because now they're being told that they were foolish. They should have just snuck into the United States, and, uh, and they would be put on the fast track to citizenship. Uh, and 
none of these people who broke into this country, they're all lawbreakers. Now, a lot of them are good people. I don't deny that, but they're lawbreakers. They have not been checked out for criminal records. They have not been checked out for security. They're going to be checked out by the INS, which just yesterday sent a letter saying to that flight school down there in Fort Lauderdale that this nice fellow, Mohammed Atta, yeah. passes, and he got a student visa, and he's wow. okay. Unbelievable. They've only got the letter uh, down can, there. Yeah. You can check him out not only for the Piper Cubs, but give yeah. him a chance to fly yeah. some of the big stuff. Yep. <laughs> uh, and it, this is just, I mean, I, I find it incomprehensible in that the, I know the president's made some sort of commitment to Mr. Fox, and I think the president's done a wonderful job on the war, but this is just wrong. And the Republican Party was just wrong to do this. It, uh, people don't want it. It was snuck through in the, in the dark of night, virtually. It, yeah. I, I mean, I just, I tell you, I drove all the way down from Philadelphia this morning, you know, and I could have I could have pushed that navigator all the way down those 150 <laughs> miles. I was so angry when I, I saw it going through last night. But I'll tell you what maybe we can do. I believe, and I haven't studied it closely, it's for six months. And if so, the Six months will end up around election time this fall. And if that's the case, and, and we ought to just tell the I would tell the folks, look, if you vote for this, I'm not voting for you. That's all there is to it. Pat Buchanan with us. Pat, it's, um, you know, they'd, they'd like to put it in the category of, of a prejudice against certain people. That's not uh, the case. But the, like you say, there are legal ways to do things. There's illegal ways to do things. And this is a reward for breaking the law. They've rewarded the gate crashers and the lawbreakers. Yeah. I'm sure all of us have gone to a movie one time, which was really popular, and we waited in line, and we saw about four or five people crash into line, yeah. get tickets, and go in. And you know how angry and exasperated we all get. Right. Well, suppose the entire theater filled up with people who did not pay and just broke into the theater. And then someone came out and announced, "Look, uh, I'm sorry, it's shut down for this feature. We're giving, we're letting all these fellows watch the movie," and that's what's happened. And it, from every standpoint, it is a demoralizing thing. And clearly the American people have expressed themselves in polls and in referenda that we want legal immigration, uh, restricted somewhat, down to 250000 a year, and we want the law-breaking stopped into our country. And why they would give this amnesty uh, to lawbreakers, it, it just escapes me. And I'm afraid the message going to go out to the world is, look, mm -hmm. you're fools to wait in line, go... Yeah. Uh, run across the southern border of the United States and wait for the next amnesty and you're in. Yesterday I spoke with a young Romanian doctor who's here in this country on a visa, going through lots of hoops to get a medical license here and then to become a citizen, which will take five years or so. And, uh, you know, it made me think about a person who wants to be in this country that much that they will do that and contrasting it with this. But, Pat, uh, I think what we have to talk about here is this whole idea of assimilation because certain people and immigrants throughout our history have assimilated well and contributed to our culture but we're talking about something very different here aren't we we certainly are uh, the people the people you want to come here are, are people first they love this country so much they'll wait years they want to become americans more important they want their children to be part of this country to share its history its heroes but what we have in the country now in addition to a lot of folks like that are eight to eleven million people who have broken into this country illegally 300,000 have been ordered deported for various reasons, including serious felonies, and they've disappeared into our population. 6,000 are from al-Qaeda countries, hmm. or countries that harbor al-Qaeda. Well, our whole, I mean, from the standpoint of national security, 9-11 should have wakened us up that for the first time in our history, the enemy is inside the gates. I mean, in World War II, there was not a single act of sabotage or assassination of an American leader by any of the Germans, Japanese, or Italians whom we fought in World War II. We were that secure. Mm -hmm. But now, I mean, everyone knows we are wide open. And while it is right to go after these killers in Afghanistan, we got sleeper cells right in here in America. And, hey, I'm sorry, Pat, go ahead. You know, and just the idea, uh, I mean, of providing amnesty, how, and again, the INS is going to check these people out when we had this complete joke this morning, uh, six months later, Mohammed Atta? Yep. It's cleared for flight school? Sure. Pat Buchanan today, our guest on Point of View. And let's talk to Ingo in Tennessee. Hi, Ingo. Hello. Take it away. Hello, Pat and Marlon. Yeah, um, go ahead. I just wanted to confirm Pat's statement about uh, what he said about Europe and the extreme influence of Islam on mm. politics and society over there. I'm originally from Germany, and I just have to say that Pat's right. Uh, I, 
I've seen Islamic religion classes in public schools in Germany. I've seen a pastor, a Christian pastor, fired for protesting against the building of a mosque. And um, now there is also a red small Islamic party in Germany who wants to give Islamic immigrants the right to vote. I mean, they're not naturalized, they're not some Germans, but they would lo love to have them vote and gain even more power. And I think that has to stop. What do you think, Ben? Well, I look, I, I look, I, I think Europe has, I mean, has, this is a terrible problem for Europe. First, I mean, Germany, for example, is a very small country. It's about the size of Washington and Oregon. It's got 80 million people. And you bring folks, Islamic folks, come in from a different culture and civilization, and some of them antipathetical to Christianity, and you've got real potential social problems in these countries. But as I point out in Death of the West, one of the problems is the German people are dying out. There are 80 million people there now. I guess 82 about is exact right. They're going to lose 23 million of those in the next 50 years. Wow. And the, the German people, are. there's only going to be, out of every 150 people on Earth, only one is going to be a German. Mm -hmm. And they're going to need someone to take care of those aging, dying folks over there. And the Turks are coming into Germany, of course, and they're coming in from Islamic countries. They're coming in through Istanbul by the hundreds of thousands every year. Let me take a break. Pat Buchanan with us, phone number if you'd like to talk to him, 1-800-351-1212. Quick break here, and we'll come back and take some more calls for Pat. The Bible says in Ephesians 4, verse 29, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. And welcome back to Point of View. Good to have you along this afternoon. Our special guest today is Patrick J. Buchanan. The Death of the West is the book. How dying populations and immigrant invasions imperil our country and civilization. Wow. What a title. Pat, looks like you've got a knockout book here. We know it's uh, selling very, very well. Uh, let me ask you this. We, we talk about the decline of the Germanic tribes, uh, whether in Germany or elsewhere in the Netherlands or uh, across that region. Um, why are, are Germans deciding not to have more children today? This is obviously a conscious decision. What's behind it? Okay, there's a, I have a chapter called Where Have All the Children Gone in the West? And clearly we know the means by which children are prevented. It's birth control pills and Yes, nor plant and uh, uh, voluntary sterilizations mm -hmm. and with abortion as a backup. But that doesn't answer the question of why. That tells you how. Mm -hmm. and, and my view is this, this culture of, uh, of, of meism, of individualism, yes. of uh, you know, hedonism, of, 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 of consumerism, of the good life, and the, I, this idea of a good life being uh, not what mom and grandmom had, uh, but what the fellas have and you know, the good yeah, swing in sure. life of a bachelorette with a good income, working in an ad agency or working in politics or maybe getting a law degree. So the and same materialism that, that drives abortion here drives abortion there. Exactly, and they've embraced this in Europe. And, of course, Europe has gone through these horrific traumas of World War One and World War Two, And I think they've simply given up on the idea of Western civilization. It probably leaves a bad taste in their mouths. Many of them, when they say, well, look what our grandparents did and great-grandparents in World War One and all this slaughter and killing. And the way to avoid that is have a European Union, a consumer-oriented thing where we just have a good life buying and selling and trading. And then when we die, we die. And this has taken hold among the majority of the youth. And I, again, associate it with the loss of faith. I was astounded to find that in the Czech Republic, 3% of the people go to church on Sunday. Wow. Uh, less than half of the people, babies in Europe, are now baptized. Churches are emptying out, and the mosques are filling up. It, the, the correlation is absolute. Where religion dies, culture dies, and the people die. And this, I believe, is what is happening. Europe is post-Christian. It is pagan, predominantly. And I, I found the Catholic cardinal, as well as the uh, archbishop of Canterbury, agreed 100%. They said Christianity has little or no influence on how the young British and English people live their lives. And I think what they've said is goodbye to all that. This is a good life, and we're going to live it. And when we come toward the end and the pain exceeds pleasure, why, let's uh, go with the voluntary, the uh, 
uh, the suicide and the mercy killing and end it all. Mm. And I think this is, uh, and this is the way the, as, as T.S. Eliot writes, this is the way our world ends. Not with a bang, but a whimper. Pat, as you talk about this, I hear uh, that old ism feminism rearing its ugly head, and yet we do see in America that there's some people turning back on that. There are some women saying, well, I'm going to stay home. I'm going to have children. Is it just not enough? Uh, they're, they're, they, are, they are. There's no question about it. Many have, 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 you know, have lived this life for a while, and they say, look, that offers nothing real, nothing permanent. It's like heroin. It was a good high. But coming off it is terrible, and I want out of that life. There's no question. You, you read these stories, you hear about them again. I was driving down this morning, and you heard these women saying, look, I'm tired of being told I'm guilty because I want to get out of my job and go home and be with my children. I'm mm -hmm. going to do it. Mm -hmm. So clearly, you, I mean, human nature and that old bungee rope we were talking about in the last hour is pulling a lot of these folks, I think, in the right direction. The question is, is it enough, or is it just simply going to be a remnant that survives? Let's go to Nevada talk to Jean. Hi, Jean. Hello. Go right ahead. Uh, Pat, it's good to talk to you. Um, Hi, Jean. You state as one of the factors contributing to the death of uh, Western civilization is the loss of faith as well as abortion. Uh, but that makes me wonder why then, if, if this is true, why the Eastern nations are exploding uh is it because their religion is enough to uh maintain good families or is this a question of good against evil is it spiritual um uh, all right i think let me take the, the case of i know I, I believe it's something like 57 nations where islam is a majority and i don't believe i believe every single one of them or every single one of them i, I worked on or looked at as an exploding population there's no doubt that that faith, which utterly rejects uh, birth control and abortion, and which also is, 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 has recovered a certain militancy, uh, and the faith has become very intolerant, and it's no longer dormant the way it was when they're under the Western heel, uh, there's no doubt there's a direct correlation, I think. There has to be between faith and, and those growing populations because the correlation is so absolute. Now, what explains it in... In, uh, in, in, in the, uh, many of the Latin countries, I think, some of them retain a belief in Catholicism, uh, traditional Catholicism, which, for example, Italy and Spain clearly do not. They used to have t 8, 9, 10, 12 children. And now Spain and Italy average their birth rate is one half what is needed for survival. And so they're dying out very rapidly. And as a matter of fact, in the middle of this century, the average or the median age of a Sp uh, Italian will be 54 and a Spaniard will be 55, which is 14 years older than the median age of the oldest country on earth today. You know, Pat, uh, the statistics that you lay out are, you know, they simply cannot be argued with. And uh, whether people attribute it, uh, you know, the future the same way as you do is, is left up to them. I, I personally agree with what you're saying. But they can't, they cannot disagree with your statistics that uh, the Western civilization countries are, are dying. Well, they're all, exactly, and, and you know, I took them out and they say, well, uh, how do I know they're right? So look, friend, they come from the United Nations. Yeah. They come from yeah. the New York Times. They come from the American Census Bureau. I didn't make these up, and these are numbers simply based on existing birth rates. And some people will say, well, they're gonna, birth rates are going to turn around. And so I say, well, look. The problem is the direction is not turning them around. The direction continues to go down. Like the birth rate in Russia has been going down, I believe, below replacement level for almost 40 years. Mm -hmm. In European countries, this is a 25-year trend. And unless you, it's like a plane. You know, if it's going up, we were going up 15,000, up to 18,000 feet and gradually ascending. Suddenly we've started down. We're going through 15,000. But the dive is becoming steeper and steeper until the point where you cannot pull out at a certain point before you hit the ground. We continue to take your calls. Let's go to Connecticut and talk to Richard. Hi, Richard. Yes, thank you for taking my call. Uh, September 12, 2003 will be the 320th anniversary of the relief of Vienna, which put an end to the Ottoman expansion, basically. Uh, taking this in consideration, where should our military campaign be by 2003 to help relieve the world of terrorism this time around? Well, good question. But I saw, I mean, the, the date I saw, which was very interesting, when 
the West defeated the Ottoman Empire at its high tide and drove it back into the Balkans, whence it was expelled uh, 200 years later was September 11th, 1683. Now, where should our military forces be? I think the president's war on terrorism is being conducted the right way. We've got to run down these al-Qaeda wherever they are, whether they're in, in Hamburg, Germany, or up there in the mountains of Afghanistan, because their whole objective is to murder Americans and as many as possible. We're going to have a great debate now and on whether we ought to expand this to North Korea, Iraq, and Iran. Now, the president will have to go to Congress, in my view, to get authority to expand the war, because he has authority to go after the terrorists and any regime that harbors the people who did September 11th. And I think he's going to have to prove, or we're going to have to have, a debate on whether Iraq is doing that or whether we're going after them simply because Saddam is getting uh, is trying to build weapons of mass destruction. What do you think is going to happen? I, you know, I'll be honest. Uh, I think the uh, I think the expansion of the war in Afghanistan, or rather the, the realization that it's not over and we need more thousands of troops, and the explosion in uh, in Palestine between the Israelis and Palestinians, uh, I think are going to put the the invasion on hold. I believe the president has probably decided in his own mind that he's going to take out Saddam Hussein, but the caller makes a good point, and others have as well. We don't have the forces in place we had under Ronald Reagan or mm-hmm. pres- the president's father. I mean, we, we had 18 divisions then. We used 10 in Iraq. We've only got 10 left, mm-hmm. I mean, in the whole U.S. Army and Marine Corps, I believe. Mm-hmm. And so when you got them committed in Korea and the Balkans and, and, uh, and Afghanistan and Okinawa and all these places, uh, how many are you going to need to do Iraq? I think a lot of these things have got to be decided early on, and should we do it, and is, the, is that the best way to prevent some atomic weapon from being died in a, from being exploded, frankly, on American soil in my hometown of D.C.? Well, these, ladies and gentlemen, are very sobering thoughts, and, uh, you know, I think these are the thoughts Americans are going to have to start thinking Again, uh, I'm a fan of Pat Buchanan's, and um, I'm a fan of this new book that he's written. It's called The Death of the West, and it's subtitled How Dying Populations and Immigrant Invasions Imperil Our Country and Civilization. It's a great read. You need to read it. We'll be right back. You are listening to Point of View with Marlon Maddox. For materials offered during the program, please write to Point of View, Post Office Box 30. That's Box 30, Dallas, Texas 75221, zip 75221. Or call our toll-free number, 1-800-347-5151. That's 1-800-347-5151. The opinions expressed on Point of View do not necessarily reflect the views of the management or staff of this station. Point of View will continue after this. Thank you for coming to this YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, share, comment, or subscribe. Thanks and God bless you. You are listening to Point of View with Marlon Maddox. The opinions expressed on Point of View do not necessarily reflect the views of the management or staff of this station. And now, here again, sitting in for Marlon Maddox, is John Driggs. Along with Penn and Dexter this afternoon, and our guest is Pat Buchanan. We're talking about his new book, and uh, what a book it is, The Death of the West. More of your phone calls coming up here in just a moment. Pat, let me ask you before we go back to the phones, though. Uh, I visited earlier today with an old friend of yours, a former uh, co-worker. In fact, she told me she worked for you at the White House uh, some years ago. Linda Chavez, who uh, also has a thing or two to say about uh, immigration. Yes, she does. She certainly does. And I, I found as we chatted that uh, you and her probably actually agree on more than you disagree about, despite what some people might think. But give me your thoughts on the idea of a migrant worker program. Well, I was... <clears throat> I- I started out a long time ago in the 1960s writing editorials, the early 60s, and I was very much in favor of the, what was called the Bracero Program. These folks would come into the country and they would work at the labor in California in those fields in a lot of the, in the summer. And they came in in great numbers, 
because there was a lot of labor that needed to be done and there weren't enough Americans to do it or wanted to do it, I favored that. And then they, they would come and, they, and the, the government would see to it that they were well treated and then they would earn their cash and go home. And I favored that. The problem with it now is that you've got 8 to 11 million illegals here and we have huge communities here and and I think it becomes almost impossible to get the folks to go home. And you add the Bracero program or, or a, a unskilled labor program in this country to the existing communities, and I think you might just be adding uh, to the folks who have come in illegally. And you wonder why we don't have enough folks uh, already in here illegally out doing those jobs, to be honest. And they don't only not go home after the workday is over, but they end up bringing uh, many of their family members up this way to join them. Well, this is what's unfair to taxpayers is, Many of these big businesses bring these folks in here, and they give them less than a minimum wage or a minimum wage and tell them, in effect, to shut up or you're going to be thrown out of the country if you open your mouth, so that all the social programs and the welfare programs and the health and the rest of it and the schools for these folks have to be provided by taxpayers who are already overburdened. Those same taxpayers suffer from a crime rate from illegal aliens, which is more than twice that of, of, of Americans. And that's just grossly unfair to the American people. And this thing is being done not for the benefit of the American people, uh, 95% of whom want illegal immigration stopped cold. It's just being done for the benefit of these large corporations. And I hate to say it, but the Republican establishment is very much in the hip pocket of a lot of these big corporations, which contribute all that money. Mm. And they will not stand up for the national interest against this special interest. You know, Pat, it's curious to me. I mean, yes, uh, they are possibly in the pocket of these big businesses, but what about the Republican Party itself? Because one would think that uh, people would see that that is also the demise of the Republican Party when you start bringing people in that are dependent on the government. You know, Pat, this is what I don't understand. I mean, as I, I wrote in Death of the West, look, you know, when they, they took a lot of these people, and Clinton put people on a fast track to citizenship, one million in one year before 1996. And of the Hispanic first-time voters in America, whom he ran through, 80,000 with criminal records, 6,000 with felony records, they voted 13 to 1 for Clinton. Now, why would the Republican Party give amnesty and put on the fast track to citizenship lawbreakers who are going to vote him out of existence? I mean, to me, as a former Republican, I mean, I just don't understand the leadership of the party anymore, and it's why I, you know, I just can't get up and tell folks, look, we've got to go with the Republican Party at the national level. It's so much superior to the Democrats. And on some cases, in the New World Order stuff and the globalism and, and open borders immigration and refusal to defend America's borders, the, the two parties are indistinguishable. And I hate to say it. I mean, the president's done a wonderful job in Afghanistan, and I'd prefer simply to praise the good things he's been doing. But you know, this was simply being done so that he can go down and tell Vicente Fox, look what I got for you, mm -hmm. at the expense, I believe, of our country. Mm. Pat, we got folks across the nation that want to talk to you about your new book, The Death of the West. Uh, let's start with Jack in Massachusetts. Hi, Jack. Uh, hi, Pat Buchanan. Hi, Jack. Good to hear you. Good I agree you. that America as a Western Judeo-Christian culture with Western Judeo-Christian values is dying. And I see three federal government devices uh, primarily that are cutting off the will of the people, you know, through federal laws, high taxation, federal agencies. I mean, we're being overrun with fed federal agencies. We've had our will redirected, stifled, and stopped at every turn. It would seem that our laws and our federal government have become, for the American people, a suicide pact. And, you know, this, this death of America is not by chance, but by design. And, you know, I see, you know, big government uh, socialists on one side, big business fascist socialists on the other side, you know, I mean, secret societies, the Masonic Illuminati, the, 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 the Council on Foreign Relations, uh, you know, communism. I see all of this working to destroy the American people essentially as we know America. And uh, the values that we're being replaced with are not American values. Uh, and I think these are desperate, me desperate times, and I think it really does require desperate measures. And some of the most desperate measures I've seen among Americans all over the country, and I do a lot of traveling, is the Christian uh, house churches. Are you familiar with Christian house churches? Um, no. I mean, okay. uh, I mean, obviously I've heard of these ideas, but I'm not personally familiar with them. Well, we well, certainly know about them in China. 
Well, <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. I mean, not, uh, not playing very well there right now. Well, they, exactly. The Chinese uh, communists. I mean, they're even running down people in their own houses. Pat, it's a this, dreadful regime. If this decline of the West is by design, as the caller suggests, who is behind the design? Well, I do think there's there has been inside the West, even when it was at its greatest, uh, people who despised it, and that goes back centuries, and who wanted to first eliminate the influence of of the church and secondly, destroy the idea of independent nations and bring about a world government. It's un you can trace that back to Kant, Immanuel Kant, and you find it in the 19th century. But these were basically intellectual ideas that the Americans who built this country rejected and mocked and ridiculed. And what has happened is these ideas have taken root among intellectuals. They got a tremendous boost during the Great Depression, when communism even took hold among America's elites. It was all over Hollywood was among the intellectual elites. It was the great rage and the craze. And then you've got this cultural Marxism coming together, and you have people at the upper level who no longer believe in the idea of an American independent republic, but believe in, in world governance and world yep. government. And some of them, you know, you run into them in the street, they're nice people. And... Uh, <laughs> In, in a personal way, but they say, look, we've got to get rid of these nation states. We've got to have a world government and Kofi Annan and global democracy, and, and everybody votes for the leaders worldwide and uh, free trade, and that's the way the world ought to be. So it's a marriage of uh, garden variety liberals and new world order globalists who are putting it, this thing together. It is. Uh, uh, they're, the, the weed, they're the weeds in the liberal garden, exactly, and, and we ought to turn the whole thing over, John. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take another call from Jim in the state of Florida. Hi, Jim. You're on with Pat Buchanan. Yeah, hi, Pat. Um, the previous caller before me had mentioned uh, the globalist ambitions of the U.N. and CFR members and so forth, uh, and I just wanted to see if you had, if you thought that that was a correlation between that and, of course, your book, um, realizing that maybe the U.N. needs to um, homogenize all cultures as to to be able to uh, dominate uh, everybody as one, and this is where we're getting all this integration of uh, you know cultures with um, no end in sight, especially well, yeah. in the media. Now you're talking. The overall agenda is this: look, the the dechristianization, uprooting all the Christianity and, and its, its beliefs and its traditions and its commandments, and getting those all out of the schools. Tremendous overall assault on the old American heroes in history, which are part of Western civilization and Western history, America being its greatest expression. You root all those up, and you teach children to hate all that, and then you open up the borders and bring in people from all over the world who have no tradition or memory of what was great, and then you end, erase all the borders between nations, and then you atomize a society, turn everybody just into to individuals who are rootless, and then you put above them a global government which says, look, what we're going to do, in exchange for you giving up all this freedom, giving up this freedom, and you doing what you should do, and you be nice, obedient subjects, we're going to have free trade, we're going to have, uh, you know, uh, the sexual revolution can go on to your will, any kind of music you like, all the all the goods of society, uh, all you're going to get all you need to eat, and everything, it is the great, it is the great bargain with the devil, if you will. Uh, exactly. The Mephistophelian bargain. Uh, you give up your freedom, you give up your soul, and you get a good life, and it's all over. And that's and they get power, and they get to rule the destiny of peoples, and the and nations disappear. And as the UN is an infant little institution, it's that frankly is one of the center institutions of of that whole thing. And this is one battle I do believe where a healthy patriotism among people of all countries can win that battle. Let's take a break, Pat. Union is the model. 800-351-1212. We'll come back more with Pat Buchanan on Point of View. We'll go to Florida and Georgia and wherever you may be calling from. 800-351-1212. Be right back. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 5, verse 15, see that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Welcome back to Point of View. John Driggs here along with Pennant Exeter this afternoon. And our guest is Patrick J. Buchanan, the author of The Death of the West, How Dying Populations and Immigrant Invasions Imperil Our Country and Civilization. 
Great to have Pat along today. If you want to uh, find out more about his new book, you can check it out at uh, World Net Daily. That's uh, WND.com. Meantime, let's go back to the phones and hear more from our listeners today, point of view. Well, we have all kinds of people who want to talk to all Pat. Right. Let's go to Florida and talk to Sue. Hi, Sue. Go ahead, Sue. Uh, yes, uh, Pat, what I'd like to find out on the subject of immigration is what do we as lay people do about this problem? I mean, we hear everybody's, uh, you know, points and, and uh, you know, points of view, and but what do we do? What can you tell us as lay people, what do we need to do? I mean, besides, you know, make phone calls to our senators, our congressmen, because, you know, especially after September 11th, um, you know, and I've lived overseas all my life, and so, um, I mean, I understand, I mean, I've, I've lived in pretty much every country, and... But the problems we're having with immigration is what do we do? I mean, they're, they're voting on uh, allowing more people in. And, and so what do we do as lay people? I, it seems to me that Christians are kind of, you know, we need to come out of the closet. You know, we all tend to, to uh, say things, um, you know, what, amongst ourselves, but we're not really doing anything. But Pat, what do we need to do? Pat, how do we fix it? Uh, she has a very good <laughs> question. You know, I tried in my own little way, and I didn't succeed back in 2000. But she's got a very good point. But, you know, the, the, let me say the problem is, look, it's not only three-fourths of the American people would like immigration, legal immigration, cut back to reasonable levels, which we have a right to have and which is an American tradition after high immigration. You have a period of low immigration and assimilation. Ninety-five percent want illegal immigration stopped. What do you do then when your congressmen get up and vote amnesty for one million illegal aliens when the whole country's against that? I, I was listening to a radio program coming down Philadelphia and Baltimore, of 500 callers, 98% were against the amnesty, and then Congress voted it. I tell you, see, you've got you know, to not only tell Colin, I would find out how your congressman voted on that. And if he voted in favor of that amnesty, just tell him you're gonna, you, you would like to see him defeated. And, uh, and that, that they double-crossed you for the last time. <laughs> but I do believe that the, uh, the Christians have to become more militant. They've got to become more outspoken. Yeah. In my book, Death of the West, I've got a chapter called The Intimidated Majority. Hmm. Why is it we were a majority in this country, and basically it was our country, that we let it be taken away from us by this militant minority, which is now imposing its ridiculous faith on children in our public schools who, whose parents don't want it? And it's about the reasons why we're so intimidated. Hmm. And, uh, you know, and unless we stand up and resist, we're going to lose our country. Pat, you ought to run for president. <laughs> the American people have spoken to that issue, John. <laughs> well, you know, I think we just do need more encouragement in that vein because people get discouraged at times uh, when they lose a battle. But, Pat, it has to be a battle that goes on for a lifetime. You can't win a victory, go home, and go to a soccer game, can you? No, you can't. Penny, that's, that is so important. And uh, I'll, I confess I get discouraged at times. I say, look, you know, I've done my campaigns. I'm going down to Florida and relax or something. Nobody would blame you. <laughs> But you can't. But you can't. And you you go back to the great figures in history, and and you know I've got my disagreements with with the Brits on a lot of things. But you see the way they refused to quit, and uh, and when they were in real trouble back there in World War II, and they just hung in there, yeah. and they set a real example for people of just sticking through it. And we've got examples in our own history of people who have gone down to defeat again and again, and they've just stayed there and fought back and came back. And you know one of my favorite poets is T. S. Eliot, who I quote, and he said, you know. There are no lost causes, because there are no really won causes. That, that life goes on. This battle is back and forth between right and wrong and what is the correct way and the wrong way. And sometimes the correct way is in defeat and disarray, and it's on its back. And it looks like it's lost everything. And, uh, and it is true that the darkest hour is just before the dawn. Speaking of going to Florida, let's go back there and talk to Christy. Hi, Christy. Hi, um, Pat Buchanan, and hello, everyone else. Hi. Um, I just wanted to thank you for writing your book. I have said some of the very things that you are said in your book, and I've been accused of, of being a racist because I say close the doors and make all immigration legal and don't let anybody in without our knowledge. Um, sure. I, I think that um, the many of the people that are coming in from South America, the Caribbean states, as well as the people coming from Cuba now are communists and they are not pro-American. I have lived down here since 1990 in South Florida, and I can't tell you how many people are anti-American and say they don't want to be Americans, 
They want to be Colombians. They want to be Cubans. As soon as Castro's gone, I'm returning to Cuba, they say. Well, get out um, is what I say. I think they should go. What, exactly. <laughs> so I just wanted to say thank you, Pat Buchanan, for saying the things, coming out and having the courage, because I know politically this has been very difficult for you, and I hope you run again. I hope you run again for presidency. And um, I just keep doing the things that you're doing. I thank agree. You. Boy, she said it nicely, Pat. Uh, thank you so much for your good work. What about these people who, who are here and just can't wait to get to back wherever they came from as soon as things get better there? <laughs> I'd, say, I'd say, look, I'll escort you right down to the dock or to the boat, fellow. <laughs> I'll pay for your ticket. If you don't like it here in the good old USA, you can go back where you came from and good riddance. Let's take a couple more calls for Pat Buchanan. Art's in Florida. Art, go ahead. Hey, Pat. How are you? I'm doing fine. Hey, good to, good to talk to you. Hey, what really gets my goat is when you have a lot of responsible leadership in this country, like uh, the caucuses, the Jesse Jacksons, the Al Sharpensons, and some of those type of folks uh, set the tone and, like, the college before, start calling names and a lot of the names when you want to go ahead and enforce the law. And they set a bad example and uh, don't point the right direction for a lot of Americans. I think that's uh, troubling when they're not protecting our best interests but their own political interest in feathering their nest. I'd just like you to comment on that. And by the way, Pat, when are you going to go back to Crossfire? It's getting pretty boring. <laughs> well, they're, getting, they're bringing Carville over there to make oh, it. Oh, no. The great conservative over there to make it interesting. <laughs> I, I just missed the introduction you used to get on, uh, what was it? Who's the guy who used to say, uh, Pat Buchanan? That was, that was great. Uh, that was uh, Kinsley? Uh, or was it... Braden uh, or Press? Bill Press? McLaughlin. McLaughlin. Oh, he's... Listen, we've gone back. I'm doing that show Friday. If you get it down there, I'm going back <laughs> to torment Eleanor. <laughs> it's one thing that... It's, it's a constant occasion of sin for me to, to torment Eleanor. <laughs> and thanks to Ron Taylor, our producer, for helping me uh, pull that name out of the hat there. Uh, let's go to line four, talk to John in Ohio. John, why don't you be our last caller today for Pat Buchanan? Yes, good afternoon. My question is, um, how does one, when you talk about, you know, the borders and the foreigners and everything else, present it in a way that, as a, you know, a European-American and a Christian, you don't come across as a racist? Well, you know, it's, it's very difficult. Look, Mexican-American people who have come here have been very loyal, patriotic. They volunteer for our armed forces. They're good Americans. The question is, first, we've got a right to enforce our laws, just like you don't have... You're not a racist if you tell folks who are not invited into your home who walk into a party, look, sir, you weren't invited here, and you got to wait until you're invited. And how do you avoid being called names? You don't, because the people who want to open America's borders and want the old America to disappear are going to call you names right. if you say no. And if you resist, you, I, can, I can list all the names you're going to be called because I've, got them, I've been called them a thousand times. But right now, racist is probably the most evocative, so most people play that one and build from there. Exactly. And they, call, they think they, they called you a, a xenophobe, but a lot, of the, a lot of the liberals don't even understand what it means. <laughs> so, but they've got a lot of names, but they're going to use them all, nativist, and xenophobe, and racist, and all mm. of that. What you've got to do is stand up because otherwise they'll intimidate you. Sure. And they don't want you to fight. They want you to be, to sit down and shut up yep. while they run the show. Pat, we want to thank you so much for coming up on the end of the program here, for spending two wonderful hours with us. Well, uh, you're very kind, Bennett. Give me all the time, you and John and Marlon. I, I appreciate it very much, and uh, I'd love to do, we'll do it again sometime, and I've always enjoyed the show. I really have. Well, I know that you've been here in this studio <laughs> with us on many occasions, and I've right. enjoyed meeting you in person, but it's been great to have you by phone today. Um, I guess, uh, you know, just maybe a last real quick word on what you hope people will do with this book. Well, I hope they will. Well, I do hope they will buy the book, and I think sit down and read and reflect upon it. The numbers are irreputable. The West is dying, and this book is written by someone who loves this culture and country and civilization and doesn't want to see it disappear. And I hope some of the projections I've got of what's going to happen are wrong. I fear they are right. But people should look in their own heart and see if this isn't exactly what is happening now and what is likely to happen, and whether we really want to even turn it around. Out of time, Pat. Thank you. Pat Buchanan, our guest today, the book, The Death of the West. More tomorrow. Open lines on Point of View. See you then. You have been listening to Point of View with Marlon Maddox. For materials offered on the program, please write to Point of View, Post Office Box 30. That's Box 30, Dallas, Texas 75221, zip 75221. Or call our toll-free number, 
1-800-347-5151. That's 1-800-347-5151. Point of View is produced by International Christian Media and is supported by your tax-deductible contributions.